So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start in a minute the conversation with Kevin Rudd. He is, uh, our, to my knowledge, can you hear me well? To my knowledge, he is in New York. Kevin, I don't hear you. We need your voice. Washington. In Washington. So, uh, apparently, oui. ca can everybody uh, see Kevin? Yes. So, I was told that you were in your car. So, that means that you have a beautiful car, obviously. It is a very big car, uh, Thierry. This is the ambassador's car. It is the biggest car you have ever seen. It's for my house. So, how are you? <laughs> you look I'm well. good, my friend. Um, I'm, I'm adapting to my new job as uh, ambassador. You know, so. Yes. Well, it is not the, the right place to ask you uh, why it is better to be ambassador of Australia uh, to uh, the United States, uh, uh, being a former prime minister and the uh, uh, president of the uh, Institute of the... Uh, uh, Asia, uh, uh, that's the Asia, the, the Asian Institute, not, the Asia Institute of the Asia Society, Society, yes. But we will not discuss personal matters. So tonight, uh, of course, Kevin, we are going to talk about China. Uh, and uh, my first question uh, is quite easy. Uh, your last book was published, I think, uh, about a year ago or so. And um, you were a little more pessimistic about uh, the uh, evolution of the US-China uh, uh, relations than you were earlier. Uh, in other words, uh, you no longer excluded entirely the two city trap. Uh, so, uh, has uh, your uh, analysis uh, changed in the last uh, few months? Well, first of all, thank you, Thierry, uh, for inviting me to the World Policy Conference and to all of uh, our friends and colleagues meeting in Dhabi. Um, on the US-China relationship, uh, I continue to be a realist there are certain structural things which have not changed. Number one, China is more powerful militarily, economically, technologically than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. And number two, Xi Jinping has decided that China will no longer be a status quo power, but will seek to change the regional and global order in a direction which is more compatible with Chinese interests and values. And thirdly, since 2017-18, the United States has responded with its doctrine of uh, strategic competition. And those three things are the fundamentals driving the state of the US-China relationship. Right now, as the two leaders prepare for a summit in uh, California in two weeks' time. Um, nothing has really changed from what I've just described. I think the Chinese interest as we approach the summit, however, is to try and stabilize the relationship at a political and economic level. And their interest in doing that is to try and renormalize economic relations both with mm -hmm. the United States and US allies in Europe and in Asia. But at the same time, China at this stage has no real interest in normalizing or even stabilizing the military relationship because China has still got its plans in relation to Taiwan. So I think that's where we're up to at the, mes at the moment, period. It's good that the two leaders are meeting, but we should be very cautious about our expectations of what comes out the other end over the years. How, how would you... Uh describe the domestic uh, political uh, situation and uh, the, uh, de the degree of seriousness of the economic difficulties? Well, as in uh, all our countries, whether it's the United States, 
China, France, Australia, uh, our foreign policy and our security policy sometimes is shaped significantly by our domestic circumstances. In the case of China, um, as I've been writing for the last five years, China's growth model is in trouble. Um, and we've seen the evidence of that, that in the most recent economic data, uh, including the October economic data, which is negative. Uh, manufacturing down, services static, uh, housing still in a state of collapse, and that represents 28% of GDP. So the overall economic climate in China is bad, whatever the Chinese system may say about it. Um, secondly, it therefore produced one of the impetus behind China's interest in the summit theory uh, in order to, as I said before, create a greater sense of normality in geopolitics in order to encourage domestic and foreign investors to rediscover their confidence in China uh, and to try and renormalize trade flows. Because if you have declining trade, and if you have declining foreign direct investment uh, and less uh, positive uh, portfolio investment, then all this uh, contributes to China's poor economic growth. So I think that's the connection right now. Some analysts uh, say that the goal of catching up of becoming uh, equal uh, to uh, the United States or possibly the number one uh, power uh, around the middle of the century is now uh, no longer uh, achievable. Uh, would you uh, agree with that? Well, I think um, we paraphrase what um, Joe Lai is supposed to have said in the 1950s about the significance of the French Revolution. Um, when asked uh, what the significance of the French Revolution was in 1789, Joe and Lai's response in 1952 was, it's too early to tell. Um, so uh, I think uh, it's a little like that when people make predictions about the final landing point of Chinese economic growth, it's too early to tell. Um, I think the significant factor here uh, is that the uh, pace of economic growth, which the Chinese had assumed to be around about 6% for the decade ahead, is now likely to be as low as 2 to 3%. And if you start to have 2 to 3% real growth, whatever the official statistics say, and if the U.S. economy is currently growing at five, um, and let's just say re reversed trend at three, then of course the gap doesn't close very much between China and the United States. So therefore, I notice that Goldman Sachs have continued to adjust their prediction points from when the two economies will achieve comparable size in gross domestic product measured by market exchange rates. Um, the original projections had that occurring in the late 20s. Goldman's have now pushed that off to the late 30s. Um, and so um, when you and I are gathered at this conference in the 2040s, we may still be having this conversation. And uh, if we focus on the technological aspects of uh, development, uh, how do you uh, uh, assess today the capabilities uh, of, of China? Are they strengthening their technological um, capabilities? And how would you compare those to those of the United States? I think it's fair to say that um, China has achieved enormous progress in most of the in critical technology categories that they would define as being strategic, starting with um, semiconductors, moving through artificial intelligence, moving through quantum computing, and then new materials research, 
and then the rest, including uh, in biotechnology. Um, these have been the priorities of the Chinese system since the 2015 uh, technology strategy, uh, which Xi Jinping announced. For China to become dominant or near dominant in these technology categories by 2030. So China has made significant progress, but so too has the United States, and so too have American allies around the world. And so if we look at each of these categories, it is difficult to point to a single one of them where we would say definitively China is ahead of the United States. Um, on semiconductors, for example, which is fundamental to everything, because it's all to do with the speed uh, of computing and the uh, intensity of computing power. Um, we do not see evidence as of now that China has fundamentally closed the gap with the United States. Uh, it's still somewhere between three, five, and seven years behind. And, and when the U.S. ecosystem is able to draw uh, relatively easily on what's happening in Taiwan uh, with TSMC, uh, in Korea with Samsung, with the Japanese and with the Dutch and with others, um, there is some reason for confidence that the U.S. and the democratic world are likely to hold on to their advantage, at least for a while yet. And uh, if we stay on the the issue of eco well, the economic, uh, technological uh, issues, there are a lot of discussions, of course, about the car uh, industry or industries. <clears throat> uh, do you think that the uh, uh, the, the Chinese will uh, eliminate uh, some of the largest car companies, uh, including, for instance, in Europe, uh, if I want to be a little provocative, uh, Mercedes, for instance, uh, or uh, uh, BMW, not to speak of uh, Renault and, and others, is uh, how do you see this uh, major competition and how do you relate that to the issue of trade war, or, which is more or less uh, going on? Well, uh, as you know, Thierry, I've always been somewhat francophile. I've always preferred my Renaults over my BMWs. But um, that's uh, just for your personal information. Um, China's strategy on automobiles is pretty clear. Uh, it's to take control over the EV revolution globally uh, and to become the dominant uh, global factory for all EV production for the world, uh, which places there for the US, the Germans, the French, and the other um, 12 countries around the world who manufacture uh, classical motor vehicles using internal combustion engines, many of whom have been late to EV conversion. Um, secondly, I uh, think that because the Chinese have taken such a strategic position with their access to critical minerals, uh, battery production, uh, and of course their ability to manipulate price through domestic subsidy. They are now in a dominant position. And I know uh, in uh, Brussels, the European Union is deeply uh, concerned about the impact that this will have on all European uh, auto manufacturers. The same view here in the United States, by the way. So where does this lead? Um, I think uh, uh, knowing a little bit, a bit about European politics that I do, uh, not just in La Belle France, but also in uh, Germany, uh, it's not hard to imagine combined action being now taken out of Brussels uh, against uh, a fear of Chinese dumping uh, cheap subsidized uh, electronic vehicles onto the European market. Of course, uh, European consumers may have a different view because they'll be a lot cheaper. But that may be only short term. China's industrial policy practice has been to eliminate opposition and competition, uh, monopolize the market, 
and then increase their prices afterwards. But this will be a huge challenge for European trade policy and industrial policy as well. And uh, if we take a look at the aircraft uh, industry, do you think that uh, in 10 years from now, for instance, uh, they will uh, compete uh, with uh, Boeing and Airbus? And uh, of course, if we get to three major aircraft companies, uh, at one of the three will be eliminated. So who uh, will uh, remain? Well, uh, Thierry, that's uh, beyond my pay grade. Um, uh, I, uh, I can't make that prediction. But I can say to you this, that the Chinese have been much slower at mastering uh, large-scale jet passenger aircraft than they have been with uh, electronic vehicles uh, on the ground. That's not to say they won't get there. But I know that it's taken a long time for Chinese prototypes to be produced. And the Chinese are still very large customers of uh, Airbus and Boeing, not because they love Airbus, not because they love Boeing, but at present they judge they've still got a problem. So if we can switch, it's not very easy, you know, when, you, when we discuss uh, like that to take uh, questions from the, from the floor. Uh, but so, so I will continue to ask a question myself. And let us switch perhaps to uh, international uh, uh, issues, to foreign uh, uh, policy issues. What is your uh, most uh, important concern today? Uh, uh, is it uh, well, today, when I say today, I mean today. Uh, is, it, uh, is it Taiwan or uh, another issue? Because I now live and work here in Washington, and I know the American system quite well, and I was on a panel just uh, last week with the new French ambassador uh, to the United States as well, Laurent Billy, who knows China well. He was most recently France's ambassador in Beijing. I think um, the analytical view we have here is the United States, uh, through its own strategic lens, sees uh, its number one strategic challenge in the 21st century is China's rise and China's challenge to the existing regional and global uh, rules-based order, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but worldwide. Number two, of course, is uh, Russia's current challenge to the European security order uh, through the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and this uh, is of... Uh, fundamental interest, not just to Europeans, but to all of us. One of the reasons why even a country as distant from Ukraine as Australia is now contributing billions in uh, direct military aid to the Ukrainians, because we see this as a global issue and not just a regional issue. But this is, uh, comes uh, a near second in the US list of priorities. Um, and a third, of course, is the uh, rolling uh, crisis in the Middle East which, as you know, uh, always draws us back uh, into the vortex of um, not just um, uh, uh, Gaza, not just Israel, not just Palestine, but the absence of a two-state solution to underpin long-term security in that part of the world. So that what comes in as third. The challenge of being the American superpower is to manage these three simultaneously. And our Prime Minister was in this uh, city last week for a four-day state visit. He spent a lot of time with President Biden and with the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, and the Secretary of Defense. Our conclusion is the United States, despite all these challenges, uh, is managing effectively to walk and chew gum at the same time. They are managing these three challenges simultaneously reasonably well. Um, given uh, all the pressures on them domestically as well. They would be my top three, apart from fundamental technological disruption of everything, uh, led by um, artificial intelligence, which, of course, uh, reaches over all domains, not just military, uh, not just economic, uh, but also various societies, the way in which we live and operate as uh, human beings. That comes in uh, over and above all of uh, the three that I've listed here. 
On uh, Ukraine, uh, do you think that uh, China has uh, very clear-minded uh, objectives? Yes, so China is a strategic culture of deep realism. And when they look at Ukraine, they look through the lens of the fundamental importance of their relationship with Russia. Um, and the fact that China now has a benign border with Russia, given that in the history of Russia, China going back 400 years, including during the Soviet period, most of that history has not been benign. That's point number one. Number two, if you've got a benign border with Russia, you can concentrate all your strategic assets on the ultimate strategic competition with the United States uh, for the future of the regional and global order. Number three, I think, uh, from Beijing's lens, uh, is that uh, Russia in Ukraine provides rolling strategic distraction for the United States uh, and its allies. And four, uh, Russia provides a readily available source of energy and raw materials to China to help meet some of its uh, own domestic economic needs. So the Chinese are very clear-eyed about uh, this theory. I think as things move towards uh, perhaps greater military stalemate in the battlefields in Ukraine, depending on what happens in um, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, and elsewhere, uh, the Chinese may seek to become next year sometime more active diplomatically to be seen to be drawing uh, this uh, conflict towards a conclusion. Um, but uh, it will not do so in any way which would cut across the deep personal relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin or the deep realpolitik uh, of the uh, Russia-China relationship that I referred to before. But apart from uh, personalities, would you agree with the idea that Russia has become a so-called junior partner of China? Apart from personalities. Absolutely. Sorry? Absolument. Absolument. <laughs> You're sorry not. Just, no, no. Absolutely is what I'm saying. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, uh, against any measure, uh, the Russian economy, by the way, today is about the same size as the Australian economy. Let's put this into context. Um, it just happens to have um, one of the world's largest um, uh, nuclear arsenals. So uh, it's very much the junior partner, and that's been uh, consolidated and solidified uh, through the processes of, frankly, the last decade, beginning with the first Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014, in March that year, uh, through until now as Russia has progressively isolated itself from the international community through its actions. Uh, and as a consequence, China has occupied that strategic vacuum. And whereas the Russian people and the Russian political class may not welcome that, any empirical observer would conclude that that is now the case. Russia is now very much uh, the junior partner. And my dear friend Thierry, I'll need to leave you soon, I'm afraid, because um, my friends in the Etats Unis uh, are, are waiting for me elsewhere, so uh, uh, I'll head off soon. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so I will just take uh, one last... Uh, I am aware that time is up, but uh, one last question. You spoke about strategic destruction. Uh, strategic destruction, I like uh, this, uh, this concept. But would you say uh, also that uh, the new war, the, Middle East war, uh, Israel, Hamas, uh, would you say that it, uh, it is a strategic destruction from the viewpoint of, from, well, the, view, from the viewpoint of the, of the Chinese? Certainly it's not a strategic distraction if you're Israeli, no, not a strategic distraction if you're Palestinian, yeah, or in the wider Middle East. It has its own uh, tragic and human dimensions, which you're familiar with and which I'm familiar with. And we both have many friends uh, in both communities. From the Chinese perspective, when they look at it, it is always a double-edged sword, Thierry. 
on the one hand, yes, they will conclude that the United States, if you like, has challenges on three significant fronts at once. The Middle East, Ukraine, and of course the Indo-Pacific. But on the other hand, China's interests are not served uh, by the Iranians overreaching. The Iranians are uh, unleashing their proxy organizations in Hezbollah um, and uh, elsewhere across the Arab world to escalate this from being uh, Israel, Palestine, Gaza into a pan-regional conflict. And the reason for that is that China has spent a lot of time seeking to normalize its relations with um, the Emirates, where you are at present in Abu Dhabi, uh, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and with the other Gulf monarchies. And as soon as you have a binary conflict involving Iran and or Iranian proxies and Israel, and by extension the United States, um, you automatically create a binary again in the strategic policy calculus in Abu Dhabi and in Riyadh, and that is not in China's interest. That would be my thought. Well, the best moments have to come to an end. Uh, I think we, all of us, are very happy to see you in uh, very good shape. Uh, uh, it seems that the Australian uh, um, embassy in, in, in Washington is a, a nice uh, place uh, to be. Uh, maybe uh, someday you will welcome the uh, delegation of the World Policy Conference in your quarters. But anyway, uh, Kevin, thank you very, very much. And um, I hope that you will always be with us. Thank you. Thank you, Thierry. Always welcome here in Washington. I look forward to seeing you soon. Merci. Goodbye.